Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session on the role of national human rights institutions to protect human rights defenders. This session has been co-organized by the UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, the United Nations Environment Program, and the Asia Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutions. Good morning. My name is Georgina Lloyd and I am the moderator for this session. I am the Regional Coordinator for Environmental Law and Governance at the United Nations Environment Program based in Bangkok. Human rights defenders play a critical role in acting on behalf of victims of human rights violations, advocating for redress and accountability of government and business actors involved in human rights abuses. However, human rights defenders are also victims of increasingly frequent attacks and acts of intimidation as the result of their work across the region, while simultaneously facing a deterioration of the civic space and rule of law in many national settings, inhibiting their capacity to work effectively and in safety. Businesses can act to address human rights, uphold rights, and take action and speak up when the, those rights are violated. Indeed, we see many good practices of this in this forum this week. But business actors can be participants in violations against human rights defenders in Asia, across Asia Pacific, which take place in various forms, including outsourced through private security firms that intimidate defenders, advocating against destructive local development, the exploitation of migrant workers in high-risk industries such as garment manufacturing, resource extraction and fisheries, or judicial harassment of human rights defenders through funded legal action to prevent defenders from seeking out, speaking out against violations. Business can, and indeed has, played a positive role, however, to mitigate the risk of violations through the adoption of responsible practices in different parts of their operations. Similarly, national human rights institutions occupy a unique position as an interface between civil society, government, and the private sector and the international community. They are independent institutions of the state that are mandated to protect and promote human rights through a range of activities, including human rights advocacy, education and awareness raising, monitoring, compliance with international human rights standards, conducting inquiries, and investigating individual human rights violations, among other functions. In this session this morning, we will hear from Philip Wardle from APF, who will introduce the Asia Pacific Forum of NHRI's Regional Action Plan on Human Rights Defenders, which sets an agenda to strengthen the rights of human rights defenders across the region and includes a focus on business and human rights. We will hear from the Mongolian and the Philippines Human Rights Commissions through Acting Chief Commissioner Kunan Jagal Sekan and Commissioner Karen gomez Dumpet on how they are working to promote and protect the rights of human rights defenders in the context of business practice and violations committed by the private sector. We're also grateful to have uh, Shamini Kelemanthu from Forum Asia to discuss examples of violations against human rights defenders and how businesses can take action. And we will also hear from Dr. Meg Brody from KPMG on how responsible business practice can promote the rights of human rights defenders by working with NHRIs. We ask you throughout this session this morning to please ask questions in the question and answer box at any time throughout the session. You should be able to see the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. So please do ask any questions from that function throughout the session. I'm going to start uh, by turning to Philip. Um, Philip, 
is the legal and policy manager at the Asia Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutions, where he provides advice to APF members and government on domestic legislation and human rights policy. Philip, can I ask you please to introduce the role of NHRIs to support human rights defenders and also share with us a bit more about APF's HRD policy. Thank you, Philip. Over to you. Uh, sure. Thank you, Georgie, for the warm welcome and, um, and for inviting the APF to be a part of this very important and uh, timely event. Um, for those of uh, those in the audience that don't know us, the APF is a regional human rights organisation that represents national human rights institutions or NHRIs from across the Asia Pacific region. We have a growing membership of, of, of institutions that currently comprises 25 members stretching all the way from Palestine in West Asia to Samoa in the Pacific. As independent state institutions, NHRIs are uniquely placed to facilitate dialogue and develop other joint initiatives between groups of stakeholders uh, with at times divergent interests, including government, civil society, the international community, and crucially the private sector. It's a real pleasure in particular to participate in this event today with Acting Chief Commissioner Kunan Jagosaikan from the National Human Rights Commission of Mongolia and also Commissioner Karen Dumpit from the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines, both of whose institutions are long-standing members of the APF and have established a wealth of experience in protecting and promoting the rights of human rights defenders in their respective jurisdictions. In the Asia Pacific region, we're observing a significant deterioration in the human rights uh, situation in many national contexts. This is partly driven by the COVID-19 pandemic and associated restrictions we've seen over the past 18 months on freedoms of association, assembly, expression and access to information, which are all narrowing the space for political dissent and, and dialogue. Although at the APF, we see this trend as a much broader concern. It's placing considerable pressure on our membership as, um, and as Georgia, you identified as, as the key interface between defenders, government and the international community. Uh, as, as a response to this growing climate of intimidation and targeting of defenders, the APF has developed a four year regional action plan on human rights defenders, which uh, signifies the commitment of our membership to strengthening the protection and promotion of the rights of defenders across the region. Fundamentally, the Regional Action Plan is a symbol of our commitment to the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions, or GANRI's uh, Marrakesh Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. According to this commitment, the APF Regional Action Plan contains a set of actions, both at the regional and national levels, to implement our collective responsibilities under the Marrakesh Declaration. These actions establish an ambitious agenda and will require significant work by the APF and our individual members across the region to improve the situation for human rights defenders. A, a central principle and something I wanted to reinforce about the Regional Action Plan is a recognition that NHRIs are both champions of the rights of defenders but importantly, they're also defenders themselves, which is an important dimension that's often overlooked in narratives on human rights defenders. As we're short on time at today's session, I won't take you through each commitment in the Regional Action Plan, although I would encourage you to visit the APF website and review the detail of the Action Plan if you haven't already done so. Given the topic of today's session, I, I wanted to speak briefly about how the Regional Action Plan and more fundamentally, the role of NHRIs is relevant to the business and human rights agenda. The Regional Action Plan on Human Rights Defenders recognises that private sector actors are frequent participants in violations against defenders. We see this in our region through many egregious examples, particularly with large and multinational corporations involved in natural resource extraction, fisheries, manufacturing, um, and other large-scale industries. 
large and complex cross-border supply chains also enable private sector violators to escape accountability for reprisals and intimidation of defenders who speak out against violations at the local level. I'm sure we'll hear more um, on these examples from other speakers today, um, but it's something that we've we've certainly recognised as an important dimension or feature of the, the, the human rights landscape in the Asia Pacific region when developing our, the APF's regional action plan on, on defenders. There are many ways that NHRIs, through the framework of the APF regional action plan, can respond to this concern in our region. NHRIs play a key role in awareness raising and the promotion of the rights of defenders. In this respect, the APF has an important function to raise awareness of violations and cases of intimidation of defenders at the regional level. Under the Regional Action Plan, we've committed to building a publicly available repository of data on violations against defenders, drawing on statistics collected by our members at the national level. Crucially, this will be an important resource to identify the nature and extent of private sector involvement in violations um, APF members have also committed to advocating for law and policy at the national level to strengthen the rights of human rights defenders. The development of national legislation to protect HRD rights is politically com complex, although the private sector can and should take part in any national law reform consultations to demonstrate their commitment to these key protection frameworks. In this context, business can also leverage their relationships with powerful political actors to signify support for such reforms. Um, APF members from Mongolia and the Philippines both have direct experience with HRD protection law reform, and I understand we'll speak to some of their work in this area later in the session. Uh, NHRIs are also able to build and strengthen partnerships with different actors to support the rights of defenders. For instance, NHRIs must forge productive relationships with counterparts in civil society to respond to violations against defenders when and where they take place. At the regional level, the APF is working to strengthen its collaboration with Forum Asia to work together on raising awareness of violations among a host of other joint initiatives to support the rights of defenders. NHRIs at the national level have also established robust partnerships with defenders networks and other civil society organisations. These partnerships are crucial coalitions for advocacy on defenders' rights, but can also be platforms for information sharing with defenders and emergency protection mechanisms, such as relocation and respite programs for defenders at risk of reprisals. I wanted to finish today with some of the opportunities that we at the APF see for NHRIs to work productively and proactively with business to champion the rights of defenders. Although we know a host of examples of private sector violations against defenders, there are also, um, there are also responsible businesses out there that want to demonstrate a commitment to preventing violations in their supply chains through mechanisms such as human rights due, due diligence, risk assessments, and genuine policies to protect defenders. The Business and Human Rights Resource Centre reported in August last year that only 30 companies globally referenced human rights defenders in their company and investor policies. NHRIs can engage directly with business in their respective jurisdictions to, to, to advocate for more explicit commitments to respecting the rights of defenders and other practical initiatives to implement those commitments. There's also potential for NHRIs to partner directly with business to monitor human rights compliance in their activities. We do need to be cautious in considering models for compliance monitoring as there are clear risks for NHRIs in developing formal partnerships with potential perpetrators of human rights violations. Although when properly executed, such models certainly show some promise to safeguard the rights of defenders. Thank you again, uh, Georgie, and to other speakers joining today for the opportunity to discuss some of the APF's work on supporting human rights defenders. Um, that's all I wanted to, to say for the time being, but I, lo I look forward to hear presentations from other speakers 
and I'm also happy to take questions from the audience later in the session on the HR, the Regional Action Plan on Human Rights Defenders and, and any other um, APF uh, initiatives in this area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. And I think there was a really important introduction to the vital work that APF does to liaise with NHRIs and also to support dialogue with other stakeholders, including the private sector, government and civil society. I, I think you, you did a great job in introducing some of the, the regional initiatives that APF is undertaking to support NHRIs to protect human rights defenders against violations by the private sector, but you've also identified some of the trends of violations against HRDs which have involved private sector actors in the Asia Pacific region. But again, you've also highlighted how the business community can respond proactively and can support to protect the rights of HRDs and to work collaboratively also with NHRIs to achieve this objective. Now we're going to hear from two NHRIs in the region, from Mongolia and the Philippines, to hear some specific case studies and experiences on how NHRIs have supported human rights defenders and how they have engaged uh, with HRDs in their interactions with the private sector uh, and how those have promoted the rights of, of all, not just of HRDs themselves. Um, so first, we're going to turn to Mongolia and we're going to hear from Acting Chief Commissioner Hunan Jagosakhan from the National Human Rights Commission of Mongolia. Acting Chief Commissioner has been in this position since November 2020. And prior to this, he was the president of the Mongolian Bar Association. Thank you so much, Acting Chief Commissioner, for being with us this morning. And I'd please like to ask you to share some experiences um, from Mongolia of engaging with the private sector, particularly to advance the work of human rights defenders. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Dear colleagues, dear human rights defenders, warm greetings uh, from Mongolian National Human Rights Commission. Uh, I'm delighted to share the news that Mongolia has adopted the law on legal status of human rights defenders. It was a long and challenging path till 2nd of April 2021, the day when, when the Parliament of Mongolia passed the Human Rights Defenders Law, the first specialized legislation for the protection of the human rights defenders in the Asia Pacific region and which will be effective from 1st of July this year, 2021. It should be emphasized that the contribution and support from the local uh, civil society organizations, uh, the international community, including UN, UN agencies, uh, EU representation, OSCE, uh, APF, Forum Asia and others was enormous. National Human Rights Commission uh, was always one of the active parties uh, that promoted and supported the standalone legislation with establishment of human rights defenders protection mechanism. Uh, in 2015, the National Human Rights Commission of Mongolia in its 14th uh, annual report on human rights and freedom has submitted the report on status of human rights defenders in Mongolia, along with their recommendations on need for protection of human rights defenders. In 2015, a working group uh, responsible for drafting the law on human rights defenders was established and was headed by the uh, chief commissioner. <clears throat> In 2019, uh, a national workshop on the draft law uh, was organized, uh, which was attended <coughs> by the former Special Rapporteur on Rights of Human Rights Defenders, 
and also international suicide organizations. Uh, much of the law was built on the model law on the recognition and protection of human rights defenders. In, uh, in April, in uh, spring session of the parliament in 2020, uh, the draft law was submitted to the parliament by former a foreign minister, Mr. Tsokpater. And in 2020, uh, on occasion of the International Human Rights Day, uh, National Human Rights Commission of Mongolia, together with the UN Residence Coordinator's Office, uh, organized a consultation on human rights uh, defenders issue and also on human rights issues. And on that uh, consultation on opening remarks, the Speaker of the Parliament also uh, promised his uh, commitment, desire to uh, progress the hearing of the draft law by the Parliament. And in the, on the 2nd of April uh, 2021, the Parliament passed the law. And at the beginning of the spring session in 2021, the speaker uh, in the opening remarks of the spring session also said that this session will be a human rights session. And from this, we can see that uh, there is a, a political commitment and leadership of the parliament to pass the law on human rights defenders protection. <clears throat> Under the law on the legal status of human rights defenders, National Human Rights Commission of Mongol Mongolia will have an additional commissioner who will be in charge of human rights defenders related issues and will be chairing the Human Rights Defenders Committee, uh, which uh, will be uh, a non standing and will be composed of six members. Two members of the committee will be nominated by the Mongolian Bar Association and the Association of Mongolian Advocates. And the rest of the members uh, will be appointed based on an open selection procedure. So we can, we can see that uh, the human, uh, human rights defenders protection mechanism is established uh, within the Human Rights Commission or in line with the Human Rights uh, Commission of Mongolia. And as that, uh, it is a, a completely independent uh, body, uh, which will also uh, consist of uh, non-governmental uh, members, uh, especially from the uh, civil society organizations and human rights defenders. Uh, the requirement for, for the members of the committee uh, they, is that they should have a seven years of experience in field of human rights protection uh, nationally and internationally. Also, uh, the candidates, the members of the committee should have a proper knowledge and experience on international human rights protection system and legal norms. And also, uh, uh, it is very important, we see that uh, it's independent from the politics, uh, which is <clears throat> expressed by the uh, requirement that the candidate uh, should have, should had, uh, well, hadn't had, uh, haven't had a position in political parties for the last five years. The main functions uh, of the committee is to receive complaints and information regarding the human rights violations of human rights defenders, and to collect evidence and facts, information relating to the complaint, and describe needs and importance of protection of human rights defenders, and provide risk assessment. And also, uh, one of the main uh, progresses and the uh, 
and guarantees uh, that the human rights defenders are protected and also um, brought up to the uh, attention of the lawmakers and the government is that uh, every year uh, the status of human rights and defenders and also the conclusion is on, on the risk uh, assessment uh, is submitted uh, to the Parliament of Mongolia together with the Human Rights uh, Report uh, of the National Human Rights Commission Mongolia. Also, uh, the committee uh, will be uh, in, uh, entitled to create and maintain database on complaints and cases and also uh, profiles of the human rights defenders. Uh, and uh, the committee will be supported by the staff of uh, five uh, members uh, uh, of the secretariat. And uh, this uh, is going to be uh, in line and together with the uh, National Human Rights Commission of Mongolia. So, uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the starting of, of the operation of the committee, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it will be the 1st of uh, July this year. And now, the selection process of the commissioner in charge of uh, human rights defenders issue is now being recruited. And hopefully, by 1st of July, we will have the commissioner. And uh, I would say that in a, in a big picture, uh, the Mongolia and the Mongolian uh, national uh, mechanism on protection of human rights defenders uh, is uh, well established and also in compliance with the Human Rights Defenders Declaration with Marrakech Declaration and also with the Regional Action Plan that is uh, adopted by the APF. So, uh, during the whole process, uh, the Commission uh, of Mongolia, the Human Rights Commission of Mongolia was monitoring and conducted different kinds of uh, studies. And as for Mongolia, we are we're a small country with a small population, but we have a vast land. And the, and the economic is mainly uh, dependent on the mining sector. And many people live in remote areas where there is a uh, lack of uh, state protection. And therefore, uh, and this is, uh, we see it as, uh, uh, as an uh, uh, progress uh, in, in field of uh, protection of human rights defenders. And during the adoption of, of the law, uh, there were challenges from the, uh, from the politicians who would hold, who would have a private business in the mining sector, especially, and uh, saying that uh, uh, the human rights defenders it, it, uh, law is, is not that necessary uh, because of the uh, Human Rights Commission of Mongolia itself has an obligation to protect all of the people. And also, uh, it, is, it was obvious, uh, apparent that they would see that human, right, human rights defenders as an, as an enemies. And therefore, they refused. But the main uh, argument uh, for pro uh, legislation was that, uh, and also we see that uh, it is uh, one of the main uh, ways to distinguish uh, real human rights defenders, because there are many uh, also uh, people who in, in the name of human rights defenders would gain uh, profit or would get uh, the to just to uh, act on 
uh, in the name of Women's Defenders, to, just to gain their political reputation. And therefore, the, we see that the, this legislation, this law, is a uh, main uh, criteria for distinguishing the human rights defenders uh, from the uh, fake human rights defenders. As it says that the human rights defenders should act in non-violent way. So, and this is also was one of the arguments that raised uh, during the uh, hearing of the adoption of the law on legal status of human rights defenders. And also it should be mentioned that uh, on, on 29th of April this year, uh, UNDP Mongolia officially launched the Business and Human Rights in Asia, uh, enabling sustainable economic growth through, protect, uh, through the Protect, Prospect and Remedy Framework Programme, funded by the European Union Partnership instrument and co-implemented by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mongolia and with support from the UNDP Bangkok Regional Hub and Business and Human Rights Asian Program. And from here we also can see that uh, uh, government's uh, commitment to uh, work with the businesses, uh, for the responsible businesses, in order to also protect the human rights defenders. Uh, Mongolia also became uh, one of the seven Asian countries uh, to have business and human rights program by that. And, and this program will support the government of Mongolia to implement the UN guiding principles through development and implementation of the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. And we see it also uh, uh, positive action from the government side uh, that will address uh, the capacity gaps and challenges supporting uh, awareness raising and advocacy among the key stakeholders, including the government agencies, uh, human rights defenders and local chamber of commerces and industries in Mongolia. Also, uh, National Human Rights Commission of Mongolia is now working closely with the National Stati Stati uh, Statistics Committee and to develop uh, human rights indicators. And uh, every year, uh, together with the report on human rights and freedoms, we'll be submitting the uh, statistical data that is related to human rights issues and they can measure the progress of human rights. And, uh, and by this uh, also, we are planning to include the measurement of the protection and security of human rights defenders uh, uh, acting in Mongolia. So this is uh, briefly uh, about the, our experience our practice in Mongolia and uh, as I mentioned that the uh, law uh, will be effective from 1st of July and there we also will have uh, uh, new challenges probably and together with support uh, together with the APF and support with, uh, by other uh, organizations uh, we will uh, um, and so we will be seeking, we will be uh, doing, uh, supporting the establishment of the model uh, mechanism uh, in, in, in the region, I think. Thank you so much, Acting Chief Commissioner. And really, the case study from Mongolia of the passing of the legislation to protect human rights defenders is a great success story. And it's something that I think um, we can use to develop legislation and, and push the narrative across the region 
and it compares, I think, um, in ways, uh, but also in a different context to the situation in the Philippines, where we see that there is a draft bill uh, that is currently in existence. I think also, Deputy Chief Commissioner, you raised some very important points about the importance of support and solidarity from the private sector and other actors in order to advance human rights and to generate and maintain political will. There's really an important role that a number of actors can play in order to ensure that human rights defenders are protected uh, at the, in the national context. It's interesting that some of the arguments that you presented against the need for legislation was that indeed it's the mandate of, of the National Commission. Uh, but we know that national commissions have huge limitations in terms of um, human capacity, financial capacity, uh, their ability to uh, effectively implement protection measures um, beyond monitoring and compliance and, and research. Um, so there is definitely a key need for legislation to provide legally binding um, measures to protect human rights. I think it's fantastic that um, you're working closely with the National Statistics Committee to collect data because data is so important and SDG 16 uh, is one of the most data poor SDGs. So having that collection of, of data to measure progress on human rights is, is really important and, and a fantastic success story, um, again, that we're hearing from Mongolia. So I'm going to turn now to the Philippines to, to hear some similar experiences and, and lessons of um, the Philippines Human Rights Commission working with human rights defenders in the context of um, violations by the private sector and working with um, business actors. We have with us this morning, uh, Karen uh, Gomez-Dumpet, Commissioner, uh, who has served in the Commission on Human Rights uh, through various career posts. <laughs> Commissioner Gomez-Dumpet has been pivotal in the Commission's engagement with human, UN Human Rights Council and, and treaty bodies. Uh, Commissioner, thank you so much for joining us today. And we very much look forward to hearing about the experiences from the Philippines. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Georgina. Can you hear me? Am I yes, being heard? Really. Yeah. OK. Um, uh, good morning from Manila. I'll dispense with uh, um, uh, greetings, except for a general greeting that um, uh, I hope you are all well in this uh, pandemic, in this global health crisis. So allow me to just um, uh, run through some of the points that I would like to raise in this forum. I have um, uh, perhaps four parts in my presentation. First, of course, is our general promotion, protection, policy, and prevention mandates when it comes to um, well, in general, uh, human, uh, human rights defender protection. Um, second, I will uh, delve into two particular examples that we have had on uh, working with HRDs and, um, uh, um, well, uh, intersecting that with uh, the business and human rights uh, um, aspect or dimension and working on uh, violations that are apparently or allegedly coming from uh, the private sector. And then I will end by um, uh, giving a particular example of a knowledge product that we have undertaken together with our uh, human rights defender partners as well as with uh, the government. So first and for foremost, let me just say that um, um, as part of our promotion protection policy and prevention work, particularly on policy, we do have what we call the human rights legislative agenda that we have put forward and we have developed together with human rights defenders and other partners. And part of that, as you have said, Georgina, our um, congratulations goes to uh, our um, uh, brother from Mongolia because uh, they have passed already the Human Rights Defenders Act. Uh, we are still at it, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, but uh, this forms part of our human rights legislative agenda. And part of that, of course, is really defining 
um, as you said, uh, what uh, what are human rights defenders? Because some claim to be human rights defenders, but if they use violence, and indeed they will not be considered as such. But one of the things that we're trying to um, um, uh, capitalize on when we're talking about uh, the deliberations on this particular bill is, of course, we have to balance the um, uh, uh, the interests and the concerns of our government partners. And one of the uh, one of the sections here in our Human Rights Defender Protection Bill is, of course, the responsibilities of human rights defenders, um, uh, all um, enumerated, as well as, of course, the obligations of our state actors. Um, or government uh, uh, government uh, authorities. Um, one of the main features that we'd like to offer, and we have uh, submitted this in our parliament or Congress, is the witness protection program that should be enhanced within the National Human Rights Commission um, in the Philippines. So we want to be able to um, um, uh, safely secure human rights defenders when they are under attack. And uh, this can be under our enhanced witness protection program. We have a very um, uh, modest human rights protection program. And to a certain extent, we do uh, provide protection for uh, human rights defenders who are at risk or under attack, but we do have limitations because of resources. So um, let me now proceed to um, the two examples that we have. As you know, uh, the CHR just concluded its public hearings on the impact of climate change on human rights. And this was, again, this is a, a one of the ways by which we work with human rights defenders. They do refer cases to us or they file complaints directly. And this is an example of that. As the impact of climate change on human rights uh, has become abundantly clear and there is a greater need to hold all businesses accountable for fueling climate change. The challenge for the CHR was to avoid the pitfall of force fitting the complex issue of climate change into an ideological framework because it is not just about businesses pursuing profit at the expense of climate or the climate. It is also about continuing to avail of fossil fuel for lack of sufficient alternative energy at this point that can replace fossil fuel at a global scale. We must transition the global economy from fossil energy to clean energy and all efforts to obstruct, derail, delay this transition is at the very least immoral. That was our finding. Now more than ever, uh, businesses should uphold their corporate responsibility to respect human rights and to exercise due diligence to mitigate the impacts that are linked to their operation, products, and services. Now the second example that I have is uh, about a, um, a case that was again referred to us. But uh, this time, what we did was when we did the inquiry, it was together with our civil society partners, our human rights defenders on the ground. And this is the case of um, a mining activity. Um, um, there was an inquiry on the human rights situation of farmers, fisher folk, and rural workers affected by policies in fishing, farming, land use, and mining. Um, uh, and the example of this is when we conducted our fact-finding mission in a uh, coal mining area called the Semirara Islands. And during the pendency of the investigation, the commission formed an interagency working group participated by government agencies from the national and local level, um, uh, the civil society organizations that we have partnered with, and local community organizations in the area. And we did conduct field visits in Semirara and Kaluya Islands. This is uh, in uh, the central part of Luzon, uh, I'm sorry, of the Philippines in the Visayas. And this was in 2016. And uh, this uh, interagency working group facilitated community-based dialogues um, for the purpose of allowing the community to raise questions and issues to all stakeholders. And during the working group, the CHR raised the following recommendations, among others, for mining corporations to engage the community and enhance the trust using a humanized-based approach and adopt a no-displacement policy as part of its human rights commitment. Because this actually 
sprung from a complaint of a demolition of uh, uh, their existing housing area because they wanted to make way for a, um, a new housing area that is supposedly a corporate social responsibility project of that mining company. Um, uh, for the Philippine government, again, the, this uh, last recommendation for the Philippine government to establish or strengthen laws and policies with anti-discrimination provisions to protect the marginalized and vulnerable groups from the effects of forced eviction and settlement. And as a last part, let me just um, uh, also highlight a knowledge product that we have um, uh, developed uh, together with our uh, civil society partners as well, our human rights defenders. And this is the guidance document on business and human rights. Uh, through our Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Center, uh, we organized a multi-stakeholder forum on business and human rights and we convened national government agencies, civil society organizations, the academe, and the business sector to advocate the implementation of the UN guiding principles on BHR in the Philippines. And this guidance document intends to inform all stakeholders of the prevailing norms and key expectations under the guiding principles on BHR concerning the protection and respect of human rights in the business setting. Um, uh, that's all. I think my time is up, but I'd be happy to answer all your questions. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Thank Commissioner. Uh, and again, some important lessons that um, coming from the Philippines, uh, particularly the findings of the Commission in their fact-finding missions, um, as well as, as of course, the, the case against the carbon majors. Um, and looking at the the role of uh, corporate responsibility to uphold human rights. These key findings outlining that businesses have a duty to ensure that they do uphold human rights, that they have in place policies that engage community, that understand the needs of community and work collaboratively to ensure that, um, that business does not come at the cost of, of those um, in which they are indeed trying to, to serve uh, and that they need to ensure that there are dialogues and discussions. The, the establishment of the multi-stakeholder working groups is a really important um, good practice that can be followed. Um, and again, it looks at the importance of, of bringing business into the conversation and ensuring that business has regular dialogue with government, but with community, with CSOs, and with NHRIs. And the NHRIs are key actors who can facilitate. So we're going to now turn uh, to hear from representatives from the private sector and from CSO organizations. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to have um, both Dr. Meg Brody and Shamini uh, to, to share with us their experiences and their, their knowledge. I'm going to first ask uh, Dr. Meg um, to please talk to your experience in advising and working with private sector actors to support responsible business contract and partnering with NHRIs and HRDs. Um, Meg comes to this conversation as a, a human rights specialist with experience across the corporate, government, and community sectors. Uh, Meg leads KPMG's Human Rights uh, Service Line and directs KPMG's Global Human Rights Network. She specializes in working with corporate clients to translate human rights commitments into practical action plans, which is really at the core of our discussion today. So Meg, delighted to have you with us, and uh, the floor is yours. so much. Um, look, this has been a really fascinating conversation and I think there's a real juncture for us in looking at what the opportunities are to bring that conversation together. I'm dialed in today from Australia and I wanted to begin by saying that I'm standing on the land of the Camaragale people and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. 
It's a really important recognition uh, that we hold um, really dear here in Australia. Um, and in saying that, I think there are uh, perhaps three things that I want to touch on today and try and pick up on a few points that other speakers have made. Um, and that's really asking this question about the role of NHRIs as a, as a site of accountability and what that means then for the business community and also for human rights defenders in the context of those different actors coming together. I think we also need to recognise the very aspirational role uh, that the UN guiding principles on business and human rights anticipated uh, that NHRIs might play in that space because we have to deal with the, the practical nature of, of what we're faced with. Um, and, and I think in doing that, let's then have a look at perhaps a different premise for accountability um, and what that means in a really practical sense for moving this forward. So. When I think about that side of accountability, there's a real dynamic or relationship between NHRIs, business and human rights defenders. And I think it's very important to acknowledge that literacy amongst business about even the existence of national human rights institutions is low. And in recognising that, I think that um, understanding those categories of different actors, there's, there's not necessarily neat categories. And I think when you look at that um, role of the state, the state's duty to protect human rights and the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, that becomes blurred in the context where you have state-owned corporations and where you have that different dynamic um, between, between those actors. I also think that um, when we conceptualise, just making sure, I'm just getting a little bit of flickering on my screen. Are you right in terms of audio, even if my video is not perfect and crystal clear? Yeah, I'll get it. Yes, I'm getting we can hear Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in terms of, <laughs> good, that's good. Don't worry too much about the picture then. Um, in, in terms of that aspirational role of the, of the UNGPs, um, they're considered as that state-based grievance mechanism in the context of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. But in, in saying that that's aspirational, you know, I was in Edinburgh when the declaration um, was made at um, what, what's now GANRI, um, the Global Alliance for National Human Rights Institutions and was then the ICC. And there was a real sense of how we're going to plug this particular accountability gap and national human rights institutions were held up as a, as a site of, of where that could take place. But what we know, and, and Georgina, you reflected on this, uh, is that you're, that, that fundamentally we're challenged in terms, of, in terms of the real power of institutions to hold violators to account. Um, that includes the state, but it's particularly the case when it comes to private actors, because often the mandates of institutions haven't fully contemplated holding business to account. So with that in mind, if we take things like um, the role of some NHRIs as national contact points um, and, and that particular domestic legislation conferring particular powers, and I really um, want to join in the celebration of what it means to pass particular legislation in the context of somewhere like Mongolia. Um, Mongolia's National Human Rights Institution close to my heart is where I conducted some of the primary research for my, for my PhD. Um, and I think that fundamentally um, that legislative gap means that it's very tricky for NHRIs to play that protection role when it comes to significant and severe violations by business against human rights defenders. I think we need to, to fundamentally look to other sites of accountability where there isn't that legal, um, that legal coalescing around that. With that in mind, you know, Philip, you reflected that perhaps there was an opportunity for national human rights institutions to play a role in, in compliance auditing when it comes to the way that businesses approach um, particular aspects of human rights due diligence. And I, I would approach that with caution, because I think if you don't have investigative powers, the right of entry into particular facilities, um, or you don't have um, other other aspects to your mandate and powers that give you the ability to step into that space and hold actors to account. Um, it could become a, another mechanism that is used to blue wash um, or alternatively become a site of, um, of real 
um, tension for national human rights institutions where they're unable to effectively um, end up in a place where they're able to, to uh, both recommend and enforce remedy for harm. So you raise these expectations in the context of what NHRIs are capable of doing. Now, all of that sounds negative. I couldn't have worked in human rights for 20 years without being an optimist. Um, and I, my chosen site of, of working in this space right now is, is at KPMG. And that's in part because of what we're able to do working with business. Um, and, I, and I think that fundamentally where, where national human rights institutions have this really interesting role to play in changing the dynamic, both of the conversation, the level of literacy and the capability of business to respond to their core and fundamental responsibility to respect human rights really does come down to that space as a convener. So when I think about what that looks like, we know from you know the really interesting insights from the Philippines Commission just now um, that bringing together and both publicising and interrogating uh, human rights violations is a really important way that that can take place. And the Commission on Climate Change and Human Rights is a is a brilliant global example of the way that that can take place. What I also particularly loved though just now was the practical examples that you gave in your other investigative work about the ways in which business could enhance or improve their human rights due diligence. The thing is, clearly, corporations are made up of people. Um, corporations are a legal fiction and they're made up of humans. I spend a lot of time with executives and directors and by and large, not universally, but by and large, no one wants to ideologically say we are pro-human rights violations. Just in the last, last few weeks, um, we've had things like research come out of Australia here looking at two periods, two five block periods of CEO departures. 37% of involuntary CEO departures uh, have happened because of non-financial risk. Um, broadly speaking, environmental social governance risk. People are being forced out of organisations when they're not taking this into account. Behind closed doors, people certainly evince a commitment to human rights. Now, that means that we're at the start of the socialisation journey. So when someone adopts the language of human rights, we know that we've opened up a space for a different conversation because you start to hold people accountable to the standards that they're holding themselves to. Now that cannot happen um, in the absence of, um, of hard requirements, um, and, and that generally happens as a result of law, but in being able to help business to understand how they can practically conduct human rights due diligence. I sit with um, procurement professionals and they ask how on earth they can understand the human rights implications in their supply chains of thousands of suppliers. And that's an appropriate question to ask because it requires really practical solutions. In the absence of dismantling global capitalist markets, which is a broader ideological conversation to have, what does it mean for a business to practically understand, investigate, conduct human rights due diligence over their supply chain, such that when we're, we are in the back end of where those violations are taking place, that they're prevented, they're mitigated, or where they're not prevented or mitigated, there's a very clear pathway, pathway to remediation of, of that harm. Um, and I think that human rights institutions and fundamentally human rights defenders understand what is happening on the ground better than anyone else. Being and continuing to being that voice that both helps business to understand, but then look at what the practical solutions are to change is really critical. None of that takes away, and I know and I fully hope <laughs> um, that Shemini will take us into some of those stories of where human rights defenders are deliberately and directly targeted by corporations. Um, but when we look again and step back and say, well, what's the role that national human rights institutions can play in the protection of human rights defenders? Um, part of it has to be that dialogue to support um, the ongoing change. So I might leave it there, but really looking forward to the ongoing discussion and um, some additional questions. Thank you, Meg. And 
I, I think you, what you bring really is is the complexity of, of effectively ensuring that private sector actors are upholding their human rights obligations. It is not a, a simple undertaking and holding businesses to an account it is a really critical component of ensuring that those human rights obligations are taken seriously and upheld. And you really do underscore the important role that NHRIs can have in bringing to light violations, but also, as you said, in convening uh, to address violations, to investigate those violations, and, and then to um, create space for dialogue that can start to find remedy or to put in place measures to ensure that such uh, situations are not repeated. Um, and, and so now I think, as you said, uh, we're gonna get into some more of the details of, of the trends of violations and, and how we can best support HRDs and uh, NHRIs to uphold the rights of HRDs. Um, and I'm turning now to Shamini, uh, from Forum Asia. Shamini joined Forum Asia or the Asian Forum for Human Rights and Development in March 2020. Uh, prior to this, she was the Executive Director of Amnesty International in, in Malaysia. Um, and, and Shamini, uh, of course, Forum Asia is one of the, the primary CSO actors um, in understanding trends and, and supporting defenders in the region. So can you talk to us about some of these trends and how NHRIs can support the role of human rights defenders um, as they engage with business actors? Shamini, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Georgie. It's a pleasure to be here on the panel and have this conversation with, with you. Um, on the outset, uh, let me say that both businesses and NHRIs are influential, uh, are in influential positions to affect change when it comes to protecting the legitimate work of human rights defenders, including environmental defenders. From the numbers that Forum Asia has collected, um, we feel that it is way beyond the right time to ensure that human rights defenders are not subjected to harassment by both businesses, businesses and governments. We need to see NHRIs and businesses assume greater responsibility in countries that they operate in. And in a minute, Forum Asia will make some recommendations to this effect. But first, allow me to answer, answer your, your initial um, question, Georgie, on the situation of human rights uh, defenders in Asia. Um, and then I'll follow this up with recommendations to both the business sector as well as NHRIs. In 2019 and 2020, Forum Asia documented 1,073 violations against human rights defenders across 21 Asian countries. This affected around 3,046 individuals. These are the HRDs themselves, together with their family members, NGOs, and communities. The most common violation against human rights defenders, as we, as we heard Philip mentioned earlier, was judicial harassment. This accounted for about half of the 1,073 cases that Forum Asia documented. Judicial harassment um, in our monitoring was commonly coupled with the arrest and detention of human rights defenders. And oftentimes these were arbitrary actions. Other violations included intimidation and threats, as well as physical violence. Forum Asia also recorded in 2019 and 2020, 71 cases of killings of human rights defenders across 10 countries. The most affected categories of defenders included pro-democracy defenders, women human rights defenders, and for the purpose of this conversation, environmental defenders, including those who work on land and indigenous people's rights. Of the 71 killings that I mentioned, 30 were committed against environmental defenders. And in at least 20 of these cases, the perpetrator was not identified. This is a key indicator of the climate of impunity affecting human rights defenders at large. The Philippines was unfortunately um, the country with the highest number of killings with 18 cases. 
These are figures that will appear in Forum Asia's Defending in Numbers report, which is scheduled for release in a couple of weeks. Um, in our monitoring of these figures um, and the situation of human rights defenders in Asia, we find that land and environmental defenders tend to have lesser visibility in comparison with civil and political rights defenders. And they also face difficulties in accessing resources and mechanisms that are able to provide them support and protection due to physical distance. This is largely with capitals um, as well as language barriers. This also suggests that the actual figures that we have um, documented of violations against environmental defenders are likely higher than cases um, that we have actually documented. What we see here is the urgent need to have effective and practical protection mechanisms that also take into account gender perspectives. Because many defenders belong to local and indigenous communities working collectively to advocate for their rights, efforts for protection efforts should be geared towards protection of the community rather than taking an individual approach to problem solving. So what can businesses and NHRIs do in these situations? I will separate my intervention here into two sections, Forum Asia's recommendations to NHRIs and our recommendations to the business sector. First, for our recommendations to NHRIs. We feel that NHRIs must demonstrate strong leadership in implementing a regional action plan like the APF's Regional Action Plan on Human Rights Defenders at the national level, while also ensuring that um, NHRIs are, are stocked with adequate human and financial resources to effectively implement mandates and protect human rights defenders. Next is the upscaling of NHRI presence in provinces and or regions. Um, this is especially important for NHRI mandates to be exercised effectively within local communities. We heard a one example from the uh, commissioner from, from Philippines who, who talked about, um, uh, uh, who gave an example uh, to this effect. NHRIs can also play a role in bridging the gap between state and businesses. State and business actors need to better understand the role of human rights defenders and why they need to be protected. NHRIs are primed to facilitate the sharing of information with relevant law enforcement agencies and other regulatory agencies with the aim of uh, better environmental human rights defenders protection and the protection of HRDs at large. Finally, we also encourage NHRIs to be creative. Um, conducting human rights training on, for example, business and human rights and human rights defenders for the judiciary to build judicial expertise for cases, provide submissions as well to the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders regarding the situation of environmental um, HRDs and connecting with NHRIs in the region to navigate uh, limitations. For the business sector, we must first realize that responsible businesses cannot operate or grow in a context of closed civic spaces. Trying to grow a business in an environment where cronyism and corruption rule, where fundamental freedoms are curtailed, where the environment and defenders seeking to protect it are threatened, will hamper corporate growth. Businesses are in a prime position to affect change through various means in both public and private spaces. In private spaces, for example, businesses could approach host governments with a position on civil society and HRD protection. Businesses could also come in with progressive policies on CSOs and, in, and HRDs and ensure that these policies are standardized across all countries of operation. If host governments are not willing to listen, businesses may choose to leverage their country capitals or embassies for added pressure. Second, any due diligence process should take into account the protection of HRDs, but to go even further, Businesses should involve human rights defenders in these processes to accurately reflect on the ground realities. Responsible businesses could also enlist human rights defenders to co-design transparent and effective grievance mechanisms 
to help encourage community buy-in. In public spaces, businesses could undertake initiatives, including recognizing that CSOs and HRDs are critical partners in identifying risks, while publicly committing to avoid interfering in the legitimate work of CSOs and HRDs, acknowledging that, that their protection of both CSOs and HRDs are paramount, and respecting as well the rule of law. I was asked whether Forum Asia had come across any positive examples in the course of our work on business and human rights um, or, and human rights development and corporate accountability. And to be honest, this was um, quite a difficult question to answer. Um, Noteworthy though, is an open letter that was issued by global clothing and shoe brands. Uh, this included um, some of the big brands um, in, in the clothing and shoe business. Um, this was a joint letter to the Cambodian Prime Minister in January 2020, urging to repeal a repressive law in Cambodia, LANGO, the law of uh, association, the law of associations and NGOs, and to cease judicial harassment of labor activists. The lack of such examples, or more of these examples, really, um, in Asia, is also why we know that corporations are in a key position to affect change when it comes to furthering the human rights work. As a final note, uh, Forum Asia recognizes that these are tall orders for both businesses and NHRIs, but we do believe that through strategic partnerships that focus on protecting the role of human rights defenders in communities, businesses, NHRIs, and communities, communities will stand to benefit, and Forum Asia will be um, uh, happy to support such initiatives. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Shamini. Uh, and again, I think by presenting those very clear and very important recommendations, you highlight that there's a lot that can be done. There's particularly a lot that can be done by the private sector. Uh, and partnerships, it really is striking me as something that um, they, they need to be reinforced, but they have a lot of power to affect change. Um, what uh, Meg was also saying around the fact that, you know, probably just the awareness and knowledge amongst corporations of the role of many of these actors, of NHRIs, of indeed organizations such as Forum Asia, um, means that, that, that perhaps these clear um, demonstrated actions that can be taken are not fully understood. Um, and so building that awareness or that literacy amongst corporations is, is really critical. Um, so we have had a number of questions that have been posted for the speakers. We've now reached the point where we are encouraging, please, the audience to submit more questions and we will be asking these questions. Um, we have approximately uh, 15 minutes to, to have some questions to the, the panelists. Um, I'm going to look to my question list and we have one critical one and this goes right back to the beginning of, of our session where, where Philip, you raised um, the fact that NHRIs themselves are defenders, um, that the commissioners that sit on national human rights commissions are calling for um, effective response to violations, they're investigating violations and in the course of undertaking their work, they themselves are under potentially under threat. And so the question is, um, can we also talk about how to protect NHRIs? Uh, so Philip, over to you to respond to that question. Uh, yeah, thanks, Georgie. And look, a really important question, I think, when we talk about HRDs, as I mentioned, that NHRIs are often kind of sidelined in, in, in discussions and they do, um, uh, and we can see this from our membership um, take, uh, um, place themselves at great personal risk um, acting on behalf of other human rights defenders and in, in defence of human rights generally. Um, We've seen some quite terrible examples from our membership of um, staff, um, and, and uh, there's been a few recent examples of this in Afghanistan. Tragically, staff have been killed 
um, working on the front line of um, national human rights institutions. So uh, it, 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 it is a key area of concern um, and something that came up in the in the drafting of the regional action plan. A lot of the feedback we got from our membership was what what mechanisms can be developed at the regional level to support um, staff from our institutions. One of the key roles that the APF plays is to facilitate access to uh, regional relocation and respite programs for human rights defenders. Um, a number of our, our member institutions are already supporting defenders access to those programs. But one of the key things that our members want to see going forward is more encouragement of having our member staff access those protection mechanisms. Um, there was also a discussion uh, in the Philippines, and, and, and as Commissioner Karen mentioned, the Philippines is a fa has, has some fantastic examples of practical protection mechanisms they've developed at the domestic level, for instance, extending witness protection programs for human rights defenders, but encouraging NHRIs to support their own staff, particularly in regional offices, which are at times, because of their remoteness, subject to more risk, um, of intimidation and reprisals, ensuring staff in those offices have access to protection mechanisms within the operational framework of the NHRI to provide them with, with emergency relocation um, and respite. The, the, the other key is, I think, and, and again, we, we're seeing this in uh, through the Mongolia example of law reform, to ensure that when we have legal and policy instruments uh, defining human rights defenders to ensure that NHRI staff are included in that definition. It's, 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 a, it's a fairly straightforward and fundamental um, exercise, but really important to providing that protection for NHRI staff. Um, and perhaps I, I'm not sure if other, um, if Commissioner Karen or um, Acting Chief Commissioner Kunang would share some of their own experiences as well. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. So now I'll, I'll provide the floor to uh, Acting Chief Commissioner Kunan or Commissioner Karen, if you would like to come in and speak to the protection of, of NHRI staff. So uh, thank you for uh, raising uh, this issue and giving an opportunity to also do the clarification. Uh, we see that, uh, so as Philip said, that at the policy level, it is very important to have a legal environment uh, for the staff uh, and also for the human rights defenders as well. And uh, according to the new legislation, human rights defenders will have a protection uh, in accordance, in compliance with the law on uh, crime victim and witness protection uh, program and this also is extended not only to the human rights defenders but also today relatives and family members as well so uh, this is uh, we see that uh, uh, it's a it's a guarantee and it's a safety uh, for human rights defenders to act uh, freely and uh, do their job and do the human rights protection activity and uh, as for the chair of, uh, of the Committee of Human Rights Defenders uh, Committee, uh, we have a legal protection, a guarantee, uh, immunity for, for the Human Rights Commissioners, in which includes also the Commissioner in charge of Human Rights Defenders. And the Commissioner uh, also uh, will uh, enjoy the same mandates as the other commissioners, which means that they are protected, they are immune, and no one can interfere uh, with the uh, powers or the actions of the commissioner. And and also, uh, I, I would say that uh, we see it. It is well this integrated mechanism uh, of the human rights defenders protection. Uh, is is a, is a good in a way that uh, the chair of the committee, uh, who is a full mandate commissioner, uh, will also uh, exercise its power to uh, give recommendations to the authorities and also to uh, 
uh, the demands uh, which uh, must be implemented by any uh, government organization. So by the law, by the revised uh, law on human national human rights commission, uh, the recommendations must be implemented uh, within the 60 days. And the demand, uh, commissioner's demand is to be implemented or fulfilled in 30 days. And uh, if the official, the government official is not uh, fulfilling, then it can be a ground for removal of that uh, government official. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and I will turn to uh, Commissioner Karen um, to also speak. Uh, we have about nine minutes left in the session. So if I can ask you to keep your intervention uh, brief and we'll move on to the next question. Thank you very much for that question. Just just on uh, protecting our own, just just a comment on that. We've, we've actually installed measures to be able to promote or protect um, our uh, field officers on the ground. Uh, and to a certain extent, we've moved them around. Um, if it gets too hot in one area, then we assign them to, uh, to the central office in, in the main office. And then there have been also strategies of frontlining or backlining whenever it gets uh, a little bit, um, uh, you know, um, uh, dangerous and they feel that they're in danger, then we backline them. We, we tell them to just rest for a bit and then someone else will cover for them. It goes the same for uh, uh, the members of the commission, the governing body, the commission and um, uh, we try to strategize in such a way that uh, if it gets, if the message delivery is not going to be as effective for one commissioner, for instance, then another commissioner steps in uh, for that. And uh, I'm all for, of course, supporting the APF when it comes to um, the access or widening the access for uh, for these kinds of uh, assistance to um, to uh, NHRI officers in, and staff who may be at risk or who are already in distress. And uh, uh, hopefully it doesn't come to that in the Philippines, but uh, I'm sure that uh, we will be able to access that facility when the time comes. I hope it doesn't. Though. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've received quite a number of questions now, so we may not unfortunately be able to touch upon them all. But I wanted to turn now to Meg. There are a couple of questions that, that have been um, asked to you, Meg. Um, the first one is, are you able to provide a link to the research that shows uh, the involuntary resignation of CEOs that are linked to non-financial issues? Uh, that is the first question. And the second question is, given that there's an increasing focus on ESG and human rights, how do you see the advice that you give to businesses changing in the coming years? Um, so Meg, if I can ask you to respond to those rather broad questions uh, in just a few minutes. Thank you. Fabulous. No, I love that. So yes, the link is on my LinkedIn um, a couple of days ago. So feel free to go and grab it uh, off there. Just Meg Brody on LinkedIn. Um, and I'll, I'll ask Georgina or someone to share it on, on the, the chat or the panel. Um, in, in terms of how advice is changing, this is a really interesting juncture. So in the context of the global pandemic um, and, and the full weight of what that's meant for us as a collective global society, one of the things that really struck me um, as a human rights practitioner in the early months of the pandemic was how many headlines contained the word vulnerability. Now, for us, um, vulnerability is something that we use all the time. We understand it. Um, and we also talk about intersectionality all the time. We understand that people's protected attributes or the characteristics that they hold might make them more vulnerable or susceptible to exploitation or, or violations as a result of that intersectionality. People across the world have a more personal understanding of that. And that's true of the business leaders with whom we have the opportunity to interact in our roles. What that's done 
is it's lit a new fire under the ESG agenda. Um, and now it might be it might just be the bubble in which um, I exist and, and that's always a risk for all of us. But there is a real movement and momentum both around stakeholder expectations, whether that's um, investors or other um, investors, shareholders or other stakeholders that sit around the context of business and ask business to do particular things, whether that's regulatory drivers, and I'll come back to that in a moment, or whether that's something to do with the um, the deep uh, personal values that individuals hold and the way a company presents its values. And so you have that internal activism um, and expectation that it's starting to grow within business for business to act responsibly. The regulatory drivers have been critical. So here in Australia, by way of example, the introduction of the Modern Slavery Act has opened a space where businesses that have never previously, um, either because of the nature of their operations and supply chain, perhaps they haven't been beset by the major scandals that have hit um, sectors such as apparel, um, they, they need to consider human rights ideas for the first time and boards are having conversations about that. And they're doing that now in the context of this conversation about vulnerability. Uh, and so whilst the underlying narrative is still highly compliance oriented, as you would expect, um, what we're seeing happen is as those conversations mature, that compliance narrative becomes an ambition and an appetite narrative. And that ambition and appetite narrative allows us to explore more creative or more strategic approaches, uh, not just to the tick box of human rights due diligence, which is what can happen, but to fundamentally how do we bring this concept of risk to people into our decision making? And that's that's a big shift. As legislation in Europe gets its legs, so mandatory human rights due diligence um, and mandatory environmental due diligence gets its legs, uh, and the way that that's cascading through various domestic um, jurisdictions as well, the expectations will rise again on business. And that that stat around CEO departures becomes, I think, even more poignant in the sense that we know that both executives and boards will have to have a view on this. That opens a very different site, both of accountability um, from a regulatory perspective, but also an opportunity, I think, for human rights defenders to, to open up those different types of dialogue, to require more of business, to continue to push in the way that Shimini described um, so that it's not just about um, the internal things and the pr things that you do in the private sphere, um, but for that to start to be broken open and for the conversation to be public. There is deep hesitancy around that still by most private actors, I think it's fair to say, um, and it'll be the continued um, you know, the language that has been used in fora like this over the last few years has been towards radical transparency. And I think that movement towards greater transparency will provide more and more opportunities for that conversation to be broken open publicly. Hopefully I've answered thank your you. question. Yes, thank you very much. And um, uh, we have quite a number of other questions, which unfortunately I don't think we're going to get to. Um, because we are almost at the end. I think I have time to pose a very quick question to Shamini, and I'll ask you to answer in about a minute, if that's okay. Uh, but Shamini, uh, a question asked for your views about the gradual mushrooming of legislation to control and manage CSOs, which um, should include HRDs. And we're seeing now a similar trend in, in Thailand, we've seen. Uh, of course, the lingo in Cambodia in which you referenced. Um, but if you could um, maybe have a minute to respond to this. Thank you, uh, Georgie, and thank you to the person who posed the question. Um, this is a whole other panel discussion, uh, but I would you know, try and sum it up really briefly um, in saying this. Uh, we have seen the rise of authoritarianism um, in the region before the pandemic and now. Um, and with that, especially when the when the pandemic um, started affecting the world, we saw how um, you know restrictive governments became a little bit more restrictive. Um, you know, by introducing uh, legislation, measures, uh, emergency regulations that 
uh, were geared towards supposedly containing the pandemic, but in, in reality, um, closed civic spaces and targeted human rights defenders um, more um, uh, more often um, and in more with more urgency, really. Um, and what our concerns here in in general is really looking at um, what is going to happen after the pandemic, um, you know, passes. Are these um, leg repressive legislations going to stay on? Is a big question that civic um, uh, civil society is is um, asking and trying to uh, predict. Um, the predictions are not lying in a in a in a very positive um, manner. But um, you know what we need to do are uh, both in in for this conversation in terms of um, protecting civic space and protecting the role of human rights defenders is um, really important when it comes to you know considering some of the recommendations that we have um, explored uh, today, uh, which I hope can serve as a starting point. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I just want to mention a huge thanks to all of our speakers today. I mean, this conversation is, is a vital one to have and one that we really need to continue to have regularly um, with the private sector. I also want to very quickly plug a couple of remaining sessions that we're having in the forum. We are going to be having a session later today on responsible business conduct um, and environmental action. We also do have a session on the fourth on safeguarding civic space. And so that can delve a little bit more into this question that was asked of Shamini and, and Shamini's response to that question. So please do join us for those other sessions throughout the forum. And we thank all of our audience. And once again, a huge thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, and we, we wish you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you and goodbye.